everybody. This is Stephanie Ruper. Thank you so much for tuning into the Naked Humanity podcast, where we take a deep dive and try to figure out what it means to be human in the modern world. Today is episode number 55, and I have on philosopher John Perry, and we discuss the state, the history, and the state of philosophy today. Now, we also talk about a lot of stuff, actually. We talk about Uh, his ideas about free will, and he's written a book on procrastinating that I think probably uh, many people listening to the show and around the world uh, can resonate with and might be interested in. Uh, And we talk about his experiences of uh, being a professor of philosophy for a long time and uh, hosting a show called Philosophy Talk, uh, a radio show and early, you know, a radio show that predated podcasts um, about philosophy. We have a, we have a really lovely um, chat and it's a uh, honor uh, and very exciting for me to get his perspective on uh, not just his personal ideas of which he has many, uh, but also um, how the field of philosophy has has changed uh, throughout his lifetime. He was in graduate school, I believe, in the '60s. I think he says, and throughout that time, you know, he's he's witnessed the development of. And, and changes within uh, two branches, the two primary of bl- branches of philosophy called the analytic and the continental. Um, as, a, as a quick primer, the analytic developed uh, in Oxford and America, mostly in the States, and developed sort of as an extension of this hope that uh, philosophers had that they would be able to make true statements We'll figure out how to make true statements with the sentence, which is actually harder than you think uh, to actually say something that is certainly true, you know, or to be abundantly clear with what you say is actually so much, you know, so much harder than, than you might originally think. And then the other branch is the continental um, named, so named for Europe uh, and sort of responds to this question of truth by not necessarily trying to make these precise statements, but instead gesture towards truth or uh, talk about the experience of truth uh, and human experience as opposed to sort of getting into these nitty gritty details about what true statements are. Uh, It's very fascinating um, and important uh, to understand, you know, our landscape today and how we struggle so much with uh, ideas about truth and uh, making making sense of the world and, and really getting into philosophy is the key. And, and like John says, you know, the philosophy is basically just being critical and asking questions and it's deeply, uh, deeply important. So um, I want to jump into the chat with him because we talked for a long time and actually at the end we, you know, get to chatting about my life here in Oxford and uh, the some of the ideas on my whiteboard and my favorite philosophers. So uh, I, I will... Uh, get to it. I'll read you just a, a little bit about him. Um, he was born in Lincoln, Nebraska in 1943. He has a bachelor's degree uh, from Doyne College in Nebraska, a PhD from Cornell, and he's taught at the University of California, Los Angeles, and at Stanford. He's currently a professor emeritus at Stanford um, and halftime at UC Riverside. He uh, is a co-host of the nationally syndicated radio show called Philosophy Talk uh, with Ken Taylor, and he's written loads of books, um, Consciousness and the Self, New Essays. Uh, That was 2004, Reference and Reflexivity in 2012, Critical Pragmatics in 2011, many, many more, Personal Identity, uh, Procrastination, and recently has had a few come out that he mentions on the podcast. Um, in in the last year or so. So I will provide a link to his website in the show notes if you're interested at all in learning, you know, a little bit about, a little bit more about philosophy from this uh, person who has been uh, very important in the establishment of philosophy in in the, you know, audio media world in podcasting and radio shows and the like. So um, we have a very fun uh, chat and very enlightening one about uh, the state of philosophy today. So uh, without further to do, uh, I welcome Professor John Perry. Hi, welcome, John. Well, hello, Stephanie. Very glad to be here. Hi. Yeah, thank you. I always, it's nice for me when I talk with people on the Pacific Coast because then I get to um, stay philosophically awake until the, you know, <laughs> evening hours. Um, okay, good. Yeah, which is really nice. Thank you so much. Um, 
So I, I'm so curious about uh, so much of, of what you do and sort of uh, how and, and why you've done it. Can you sort of just tell us a little bit about um, your, but why, you know, you have obviously been in the field of philosophy for some time, you know, so what is it that you do and, and why is it that you do it? Well, <clears throat> excuse me. <clears throat> yes, I was, uh, I went to Doan College in uh, Crete, Nebraska and became a philosophy major there and uh, haven't left the field since then at Cornell University. And then I, I was uh, lucky to be a war baby. People say, how did you get such a good job at Stanford and UCLA? And I said, well, it's easy. If you're born in 1943, then by the time you get your PhD, the schools are just filling up with baby boomers. Mm -hmm. And uh, so there was a, a need for people to teach. It hasn't been that way since, I'm sorry to say. So uh, in my 1968, I got my PhD from Cornell, went to UCLA, and um, I was I was interested in philosophy since I was a teenager, and then uh, at Doan College, there, it was a very small college, 300 people, there was really no analytic philosophy, but uh, I read a lot of it, and uh, decided I wanted to go to Cornell, where Max Black and Norman Malcolm knew all about Wittgenstein. Okay. Uh, or what there was to know. But by the time I left, I was more interested in Frege than Wittgenstein. Okay. Um, very quickly, I was actually planning on asking you about this. Can you can you tell us a little bit about what you mean by, you know, analytic philosophy and sort of the how that fits in the philosophical landscape today? Yeah, well, analytic philosophy is, um, or analytic, as uh, some of my <laughs> European friends call it. Uh, no comment. I have no comment. <laughs> analytic philosophy, as as I understood it and still understand it, is is um, basically basically whatever philosophy was going on at Cambridge and Oxford. Uh, in the 50s and 60s. Mm -hmm. uh, and it inherited the tradition of, of uh, logical positivism and Carnap and Russell and Frege. But it was given a new twist by Wittgenstein and then a little bit different by Austin. Uh, so as, uh, what, what attracted to me about it was conceptual analysis with emphasis on ordinary language, what Wittgenstein called language games. Mm -hmm. That is, <laughs> let me let me quote one of my teachers that you may not have heard of, O.K. Bausma. He said, the key to philosophy, the main skill you have to have is quicken the sense of the queer. Hmm. Now this was in 1960, so queer meant odd. It wasn't part of LBGTQ. And philosophy was seeing things in ordinary life and ordinary use that when you step back and thought about them were kind of odd and queer and thinking about them. And that's what I enjoy doing. I didn't get into what I call analytical philosophy because I had some overarching view that this was the correct thing for everybody to do, but it's, it's what attracted me. I, I really loved Austin and to a certain extent, Wittgenstein. J.O. Urmson, I don't know if you guys still talk about him. He was a great Oxford philosopher. <laughs> Not much and probably the people, you know, I think most of our audience wouldn't, I definitely, <laughs> I, I, I don't know. So I think probably most of the audience wouldn't either. <laughs> well, there was Austin and uh, Urmson were part of the, and Grice were part of this uh, generation of Oxford philosophers that uh, served in World War II in various mm. capacities. And when they got back to Oxford after the war, they were impatient. And they didn't want to spend their lives reading Bradley and Hegel and Schlegel and Bagel and so forth. <laughs> they wanted to plunge in and do philosophy. And that's, and that's what they did. And, and so uh, at that time, 
when I was in graduate school, I thought of Dummett as, as part of this group, but um, he went on to lengthier things and doesn't really <laughs> fit in so much. <laughs> I see. But, uh, More patient. Uh, yeah. So, so analytical philosophy, analysis of concepts, as opposed to continental philosophy, by which we met at the time, and I guess still mean uh, uh, Sartre, Heidegger, Husserl, uh, although Husserl could well have been an analytical philosopher. Mm-hmm. Uh, so anyway, I'm rambling on, but. Uh, <laughs> uh, well, no, I mean, it's it's so, it's it's very important. And I think so many people in, in the world today are, are very concerned with the idea of truth. And I think mm-hmm. these these two, like, you know, and not, I'm going to generalize grossly, but these two approaches of, say, take it, making these very small, calculated, you mm-hmm. know, moves towards trying to figure out how to make a true statement on one hand, which is the analytical mm-hmm. branch, and sort of gesturing towards truth on the other hand. I think this is where philosophy has kind of, you know, this, this is what we're dealing with. This is where we've ended up, and we don't really see a whole lot of other options for dealing with this question of truth. Yeah, well, now... Over the years, analytical philosophers have gotten, oh, what's the word? Write longer stuff, more obscure stuff, more pompous stuff. Okay, <laughs> sure. So we're, we're becoming more continental. <laughs> and, um, and there's in, in in Europe, there's there's quite a few analytical philosophers, people like Francois Reconati in Paris and, and um uh my friend whose name isn't coming to me in Germany. So it's it's not as clear a divide as it was when I was a graduate student in 1964 or five. But still it's, to me, um, philosophy is a very natural thing for people to do. Mm. And the natural thing for people to do is reflect on odd things, quicken your sense of the queer. So it strikes you as odd that, you know, uh, <clears throat> people are so sure that uh, of this or that you're into uncertainty. So I'm trying to make a connection. There. <laughs> <laughs> it's but, fine. Uh, yeah. So Descartes was, well, why do I believe in the external world? Well, that's, that's a pretty dramatic case. Um, but to me, philosophy has always been close to teaching because doing philosophy is perfectly enjoyable, but if I'm doing any good for the world, it's probably through teaching philosophy. Mm-hmm. And your typical undergraduate shows up as a freshman and their head is full of beliefs and desires. And where did it come from? Well, somebody poured it in there, their parents or their church or now Fox News or somebody. hmm and you you go on and get them to reflect on that and say, well, now wait a minute, why do I believe that? Why do I why do I think I want to be a a pre med and become a doctor? Have I really ever thought about it? Is it just because my mother and my father want me to? Wouldn't I really rather be a philosophy major or a drug dealer or something like that? <laughs> so so to me, analytical philosophy it, then starts where philosophy should start, with just a person being a little reflective, which comes naturally to some people and is anathema to others, uh, about their beliefs and desires and then getting curious as to where these came from and what they mean. And, you know, maybe eventually for people that are smart enough, that will lead to a book like Being in Time. <laughs> but, but for me, it's a long way away. Um, for the record, everybody, being in... Well, <laughs> Heidegger. I'm, I'm yes. I'm not sure anybody. I've put a lot of like uh, jokes up on Instagram about how like reading Heidegger is like beating your head against a wall. Or uh-huh. um, there's this joke. Or, like there's a character who draws like a figure eight. It's like the Count from Sesame Street, and it's like, mm-hmm. how many weeks does it take to learn Heidegger? And then he like takes the eight and turns it on its side, and it's an infinity uh, symbol. <laughs> yeah. Well, now, the odd thing is, I've come to like Heidegger. Uh, uh, I don't. I don't mean I like reading Heidegger. Right. I Me mean, too. I mean, <laughs> I, mean, I mean, I had a, a student at UC Riverside uh, who who showed me some parts of Heidegger that are similar to things I believe about the self and so forth. And so, you know, I kind of 
I, I kind of like his idea of breakdowns, which I should use the German word for if I could remember it. Uh, uh, I'm going through my Heidegger lexicon. Most of the German I know is from reading Heidegger. Oh, really? <laughs> um, yes. Or you. <laughs> yeah, thank you. Um, no, I know like homelessness and he means that in an existential yes. sense, you know, unheimlichkeit. Yeah. But uh, um, what, what, what is interesting about this idea of breakdowns? Well, uh, my, my current view, which, uh, which is, you know, kind of been developing over the last 76 years or so, uh, puts a lot of uh, emphasis on what I call incrementality. Mm. That is to say, uh, human life and indeed animal life and indeed all organisms are based on, on being, uh, uh, finding out what else has to be true or what else has to be the case. In other words, you're assuming a lot. And assuming is too strong a word uh, because that suggests you think about it or have the capacity to think about it. Uh, But you you just, you know, you're you're set up to function within a certain environment. Um, And then a breakdown is when all of a sudden doesn't work. And that's what precipitates thinking. So uh, one of my favorite examples is uh, the relativity of uh, of um, time to place. I mean, for thousands of years, people were perfectly happy to look at the sun and say it's noon. Uh, and then they got these little clock properties. Those are pretty cool. One o'clock, two o'clock, three o'clock. And some really smart people, you know, physicists and astronomers knew that the o'clock properties would vary from place to place, but nobody gave a damn. Mm-hmm. Uh, there was no such thing as horse lag. I mean, you, you couldn't, you know, ride your horse so far in one day that all of a sudden you were, it was I light see. out when it was supposed to be dark out. And then the system broke down because we got faster means of transportation. And then we had to think about it and eventually came up with time zones. Now that's a very sophisticated example, but that's the basic mechanism. Uh, you know, you're, you're, you're given at birth uh, something that evolved in your species, some basic way of knowing what's going on around you and what's going on inside you. Uh, and then uh, uh, sometimes it breaks down. And it would sound so good if I knew the German word. <laughs> you know? And uh, and what, so, what is the what is the relevance of this uh, this moment of of breaking down? You know, like what what does that mean for somebody personally when uh, this you know this system or whatever these measurements have sort of broken down? Yeah. Well, oftentimes it means <laughs> for, a, for for you know for a species it may mean you know several maybe 100,000 years of development to uh, filter out some mechanism for dealing with the fact that, uh, <clears throat> you know, the, <clears throat> the seasons have changed, <clears throat> excuse me. Um, but <clears throat> for us, it's often a matter of, uh, you know, going and reading in a book and finding out what some smarter guy or older guy, excuse me, person has uh, uh, figured out about the parameters that we didn't, grow up knowing about like time zones that now we have to to think about um and or, you know language is full of these things and i think uh, uh, uh the other thing is to realize that most of our concepts i mean philosophers in the analytical tradition like to think in terms of necessary and sufficient conditions but but if you have this incremental picture you realize oh these concepts were to get us through a breakdown and an improvement but but they still only have validity within a certain sphere of things taken for granted. Mm. So uh, instead of uh, necessary and sufficient conditions, you get what Mackey, J.M. Mackey, uh, do you know him? Vaguely. I'm a continental. Guy who hung around <laughs> Oxford uh, um, uh, calls an Inus condition, right? Okay. That is you have some big set of conditions that you're taking for granted that are almost sufficient for something happening, but then something extra has to happen. That's the Inus condition. It officially means 
on itself insufficient but necessary part of an unnecessary but sufficient condition. Sure. <laughs> so, for example, a train is going around a curve fully loaded at 30 miles an hour. A wheel drops off a boxcar and a train derails. Why did the train derail? Well, because the wheel fell off. Perfectly good explanation. But it's not a sufficient condition. Trains can lose a wheel on a freight car without derailing if they're not moving or not going around a curve. Uh, <clears throat> it was it was uh, it was the missing condition in a set of almost sufficient conditions <clears throat> that in, <coughs> included going around a curve, going at thirty miles an hour, being loaded, and so forth. Given all of that stuff. If you have this one extra thing, you'll have sufficient conditions for a derailment. But also going around a curve may have been an INIS condition. But if you hire a commission to say, why did that train derail? And they came back and said, well, because it was moving. That wouldn't be, that wouldn't be a happy thing. So, so, <clears throat> so once you have that picture, then you, so, so, so I've been thinking about freedom, free will, and you know, philosophers try to give necessary and sufficient conditions for free will. Well, that's probably the wrong way to look at it. You have to understand the kind of setting in which the concept arose and what needed fulfilled and, and what extra it was bringing to a set of assumptions about the world. Mm. And so you have to look for the, the, uh, uh, the necessary conditions or the sufficient conditions it brings to the INS insufficient but necessary, yeah. <laughs> you, have, you have to understand what it contributes to the whole sufficient condition, which itself is just going to be something that works in a limited space, you know, sure. period, of low, period of low entropy in our galaxy. Or Yeah, I find that very interesting. That's a helpful thought for me, uh, John, you know, sort of thinking, because I have often thought about you know, these debates on free will and mm -hmm. uh, feeling very strongly like we need to think about them in terms of an evolutionary context. Yes. And, you know, scientists of evolution are always saying, you know, what evolves evolves out of a matrix of what already existed. You know, you can't yes. start from zero. You have to start from the materials that you have. And so I, I really like what you're saying that, you know, there are many different factors of things that come together. And, and maybe, you know, the question isn't, you know, do we have free will or don't we, but rather like what were the conditions and what was this, you know, I could, I would maybe call it like a linchpin or like what was this INIS yeah. condition that, that sort of um, brings around that experience. Um, I think, I don't know. I wish that uh, philosophers and uh, like uh, neuroscientists talked more about this. I know they're kind of starting to. Um, well, yeah. I don't know if you want neuroscientists to talk about it, but <laughs> <laughs> well, I Neuros yeah, I, neuroscientists and, and physicists have a habit of being inspired by philosophers to say stupid things. Right? <laughs> but I, I do. Right. But isn't that kind of the problem is that we're not. I think part of the problem is that there's just not enough, you know, understanding of the different perspectives. And so we say stupid things because we don't understand what the yeah. other perspective can contribute, you know. Yeah, I, well, I think so, yeah. But um, anyway, so yeah, I think uh, the, uh, the book I'm writing, I'm trying to write, is called Wretched Subterfuge. Oh, because, that's, a, that's an alluring title. Well, that's what Kant called Hume's theory of freedom, a wretched subterfuge. Huh. And uh, William James called it a quagmire of evasion, but... That's kind of a long title, so I thought I'd stick with Wretched Subterfuge. You uh, could call it the Wretched Subterfuge, and the subtitle could be Quagmire of Evasion. Quagmire of Evasion. A defense of a quagmire of evasion. Something well, like so why, what was wrong with this, what was wrong with Hume's idea? Well, I don't think anything was wrong with it. Hume's idea is very simple. It says, says uh, uh, you're free if you, if you do what you want. If your action is caused by your desires and beliefs, then mm. you're free. And everybody who's not in chains is free. So quit jabbering about it. That's kind of what he said. <laughs> uh, and I don't like the quit jabbering about it part, of course. <laughs> sure. But I think that's basically right. In other words, I think our concept of freedom, which really we should think of in terms of the word can, because that's a more primitive 
thing, it gets at a very simple property of animals and humans, uh, which you can think of in terms of an Inus condition. That is, you've got a set of, well, let's see, what, uh, what, what, what's, what's your, are you a ballerina or a polo player or what do you do for that at Oxford? <laughs> I dance, actually. You dance. I, um, okay. Yeah. Like ballet or? Um, I've done ballet for 29 years. Okay, uh, so you can probably yeah. touch your toes. I can touch my toes. You can touch my toes. Well, I can't touch my toes. <laughs> okay. So we're both in a situation uh, where, uh, uh, you know, we're standing there. Uh, the wind isn't blowing. Gravity is normal. Nobody's holding a gun to our head. And there's a difference between us. You can touch your toes and I can't. Well, what that means is that the inus, the minus condition, that is this, the inus condition that's missing uh, for you is simply wanting to touch your toes or deciding to touch your toes. But for me, wanting or deciding to touch my toes would not be sufficient. In this case, because I don't have what I call the uh, basic uh, competences. Okay. Uh, so... To me, say somebody can do something means that they're in a circumstance where there are movements they ha that they have the basic competence to make, such that if they make them, they will do the thing in question. And uh, so that's just a way of saying what's in, in this in this in this situation, uh, they're deciding or wanting to do it would be sufficient. It's an minus condition. It's the minus condition. Now, of course, it gets more complicated because you've got luck, you've got, you know, Austin missing the putt that he can sink and sinking the putt that he that he can't sink and, and so forth and so on. But that's a basic idea. Very simple. And I see right where it fits in your blackboard, but <laughs> Do you, right at the very beginning. Yeah. Right at the very beginning. Um that's a pretty nice office. Is that what they give people finishing their PhD at Oxford? <laughs> it depends. It depends. Okay. <laughs> depends on a lot of things. Um, yeah. And the, the books are my own and so, or from the library. So yeah, um, I, I like the way you've got them organized. It's the same way I organize my books as you can. Oh yeah. See here on my. Yeah. And the, 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 the whiteboards are very important to me. Uh, yeah. You read my book on procrastination? No. Do you have a book on? Oh. Yeah. <laughs> Is yes, that a joke? Oh, you do? The Art of Procrastination, yeah. John, I thought that was a joke. You know, if you say, <laughs> have you read my book on procrastination, but you, like, haven't written it, get it. Yeah, okay. haven't, yeah haven't gotten around <laughs> it yet. No, it's the uh, most successful book I ever wrote from certain... Sure. Certain points of view and translated into 22 languages and... Wow. Okay. Uh, what, no what philosophical relevance whatsoever? Did you did you argue that procrastination is a good thing? Well, no. I argued that it's not such a bad thing if you're what I call a structured procrastinator. I see. A structured procrastinator. <coughs> one day years ago. <coughs> excuse me. <coughs> I was feeling very bad because I had. Um, you know, I had some files to read, uh, probably was chair of the department or something, uh, NSF proposals to referee, and instead I, you know, spent the whole day doing crosswords. And I, I felt very bad. And then it occurred to me, well, wait a minute. At Stanford, I'm known as a guy that gets things done. Why is that? When I know that I'm a person who just procrastinates and puts things off. Well, the answer is a structured procrastinator. I do other things as a way of not doing the most important thing. And yes. that's a very productive lifestyle. I see. I found. <laughs> uh, you have to be in certain professions. It doesn't work if you're a newspaper reporter and have really important deadlines. And you have to have the ability to uh, occasionally do what you're supposed to do. I see. So I got a book out. I won the Ig Nobel Prize for literature. <laughs> that's lovely. Uh, well, that's a thing. Yeah, yeah, I definitely know that's a thing. Um, okay, cool. So, 
Uh, people like procrastinating. It's obvious, you know, to me why that might that might appeal. <laughs> Can I ask? Um, so you you host Philosophy Talk, right? Which is a well, radio not, show. Not quite right. I I invented Philosophy Talk along with Ken Taylor, and we co-hosted it up until about two years ago, and then I, I kind of took a break. I'm kind of the fill-in host now. But very nice. Um, and that's that's actually been going on for quite some time. Yeah, it must be 15, 16 years by now. Um, and uh, I, this occurred to me because we were talking about, you know, procrastinating and the kinds of ideas right, that, that people like. Um, do, have you found that uh, in all of these years of, of working with this show that there were particular topics in, in philosophy or that you talked about that people like, really gravitated towards or found interesting or, or really liked? Um, you know, because well, uh, other than procrastinating. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I mean, uh, I, I think there's very seldom been a topic that we picked that that people disliked <clears throat> in the sense that they complained or something that the topic wasn't good enough. But of course, you know, you don't know who's turning off the radio and so forth and so on. But, uh, um, uh, I, I mean, like I said, I, I think there's a certain percentage of people that... L- are, are naturally disposed to philosophy. Unfortunately, most of them never find that out because mm. they, they don't have the privilege of taking an intro philosophy course or something. Uh, but, you know, you have radio programs for people that like opera. And you have radio programs for people that like 90s music. That makes no sense. 80s music, that's different. <laughs> Uh, so uh, we thought, why not have one that uh, talks about philosophy? And it, you know, it's. I think we got a couple, there's a couple hundred stations and and um, quite a few listeners, and people just have a natural interest in you know in almost anything. Free will, problem of evil, um, is uh, is wealth a good thing? Um, uh, even things like you're talking about, I think, uh, uh, is, is being certain a, a good thing. Um, skepticism, just about any topic you can name, we've got a program on it, mm. which you can get to by going to philosophytalk.org or something along those lines. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And I'll, I'll give a link to people so they can, yes, um, okay, right. so they can get it. Yeah. The, um, that's wonderful and fascinating to me. In your show, you know, um, while you've been talking, you have been throwing out names, you know, like Hegel and Schmegel and Pagel, um, but real <laughs> yeah, philosophers. The, the big three, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> real philosophers' names like um, Kant and Hume and Wittgenstein and whatever. Hume? And so, Hume. 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 Oh. Okay, anyway. <laughs> it's a rule in my class. Whenever anybody says Hume, you have to all say Hume. I see. Okay. Um, <laughs> no, you don't see. You think, what? Who is this loony bit I'm talking to? But anyway, go ahead. Oh, it's important to keep things in, keep me on my toes. Um, so like with these, with the, do you, you know, do you sort of, do, do you assume that everybody coming to your podcast knows who these people are? Like, you know, what level of expertise is involved in, in your show? <laughs> well, we try not to assume it. Okay. Um, and we have a producer, uh, 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 I was going to say a young fellow, but he's not young anymore, uh, Devin Strolovich, uh, who's pretty good at saying, uh, you know, holding up a sign, say, say who Hegel is, or something like that. And um, so we, we try not to presuppose too much. Of course, you get to somebody like Hegel, and neither Ken nor I can say more than five words about who Hegel is. Uh, oh, Hegel, he's a great philosopher that uh, wrote in German and makes no sense whatsoever and has been very influential. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, isn't it? Yeah, it's very interesting that some of the people who are the hardest to understand have been the most influential. It's, uh, definitely worth another another about. thing that's interesting, since you're kind of doing history, is there's so many philosophers that are known for a certain view. And then the 20th century comes along, or the 21st century, and we have all these people writing PhD dissertations and getting deep into things. It turns out they didn't believe what they're mostly known for advocating. It turns out what they did believe isn't as interesting as what everybody took them to believe. 
What do you do then? There's a paradox of philosophy there. I think so. I mean, there's this there's this problem that when you write a book, it, it becomes static, you know, but people are incredibly dynamic. And, you know, how much debate have I read about like embodiment in mid and late Heidegger, right? And so uh, it's it's very hard to see, you know, a whole person in their trajectory and, and their body of work. And, and you're right, you know, we sort of, you know, like I'll, I'll be like, oh yeah, that's Hegelian. And everybody will be like, mm-hmm, you know, but it's like, yeah. take, you yeah. know, taking this person who wrote so many words yeah and even you know i don't know it's amazing um well in my crowd we often end up talking about russell who i don't know if he wrote as much as hegel but Mm -mm. uh or heidegger but he um he wrote a lot anyway why did i get off on russell i don't know so you've got all these people on the board behind you which is who's your favorite um (laughs) Ooh, my, who's my favorite philosopher? You're gonna yeah, just 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 the dead one, so you don't hurt anybody's feelings. Well, I hate to be cliche, and I'm terribly sorry if this hurts your feelings because it's continental, but it's Nietzsche. Nietzsche. Well, Nietzsche. You know what Ogden Nash said? <laughs> Nietzsche is peachy. That is P I E T Z S H E. Nietzsche is peachy, but liquor is quicker. I see. <laughs> I see. Okay. So, I mean, I just, I, I love the way that he's just sort of at this like massive turning point in, in, in Western, you know, in the arc of Western thought so much as we can reduce us to like, you know, one, you know, one human and, and um, sort of seeing, I think he saw in, in such a important way, like the way that society and, and morality and, uh, religion had, you know, changed, you know, collapsed from this, like very, you know, God is dead. That was brilliant, you know? Mm-hmm. Um, and our world is is so much, you know, not the same. And I'm not saying he caused that, but he's, he saw it. And um, I love that. And I also think he's very uh, oversimplistically interpreted, you know, kind oh, of mis- tragically misunderstood. And uh, yeah, so I like Nietzsche. I, I, I tend to look at him <clears throat> as Hume with attitude. <laughs> I mean, Hume says, well, God, that's an interesting idea. There's some arguments for it. There's some arguments against it. The arguments for it are all wanting. And, you know, it's no, it's really not quite there. And there's no good reason to believe in it. And Nietzsche says, God is dead. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, and, and that's true. And uh, there is a sense in which Nietzsche was, you know, Twitter 200 years before Twitter existed, you know. Mm-hmm. Um and and that it's also very interesting to think about how sort of using that aphoristic poetic style that Nietzsche mm-hmm. used really made him like he could have written a treatise on human understanding, you know, like, mm-hmm. um, but that definitely that stood out in a way that, that yeah, that we, that we don't that we, you know, we remember. So have you really read? Of course you have. Thus, thus spake Zarathustra. Yeah. I, I, I try to do that every couple of years and I just, I can't get into it. Mm. What am I doing? Well, I suspect it's because you really like analytic philosophy and, <laughs> okay, <laughs> you know, because um, it's so much uh, symbolism and gesturing toward, you know, it's uh, uh, analogies and uh, stories and everybody represents something and, uh, and every once in a while, he says something really beautiful that you can interpret, you know, in, in, in certain ways. And so um, I really enjoy the book, but I understand that you have to approach it as like stories and poetries that gesture towards ideas. Um, well, my, my friend and, and philosophy talk buddy, Ken Taylor, really loves uh, Nietzsche. Hmm. Or Nietzsche. Nietzsche, I don't know. Anyway. But... <laughs> It's, I mean, I, I like him as an undergraduate. I like him. I get in a Nietzsche mood occasionally, but it's kind of a love-hate. Mm. Love-hate. Love. Love. Ennui relationship. <laughs> I see. Okay. Um, by which you mean, for our listeners, indifference? Yeah. Uh, just not not doing it for me today. Mm. Yeah. I... I uh, of course, 
Well, you know, I'm a, I'm a, I'm a dancer and Nietzsche talks about yeah. dance. He uses like dance as a metaphor for yeah. um, life. And that always really, you know, spoke to me as well. And, you know, that's, that's sort of like you t- mentioned earlier, like we all show up at college freshman courses or wherever we show up to life and we have a, you know, things resonate with us for particular reasons, you know, that are probably deeply embedded in our yeah. history. Um, so that's why one of the reasons I like Nietzsche. So, so dance though. I mean, wh- when did you become a dancer when you were a kid or your folks dancers or. Yeah. I started ballet when I, in 1990, uh, <laughs> So uh, I was bo- I was born in the eighties, uh, and it's it's I started dancing it in nineteen ninety, um, and uh, yeah, it was uh, it was very important. I think I was like I was very existentially and metaphysically tortured from a very young age, and dancing mm-hmm. has sort of always been, um, you know, my like escape into the present. Yeah. Um, yeah. Well, I, I love to dance not in the sense you dance but you know swing dancing with uh, my wife Mm. when she was willing to swing dance (laughs) uh very it's very liberating and i'm sure if you can really do ballet where are you from originally you're from oxford nobody's from oxford no no well yeah there are some people from oxford um i'm from detroit and i also um i do partner dancing like uh salsa Mm -hmm. and i can waltz and tango and stuff Uh, what kind of what kind of swing do you do Oh, uh, I just play, play some golden oldies rock and roll. Yeah, good. Grab, grab the hand and start moving. That's all I know how to do. That's the see. You're, I think you need to give Nietzsche one more pass. <laughs> <laughs> okay, okay. So, Detroit, <laughs> what part of Detroit? Um, I am from Warren, actually, which is a, a little north and east, maybe. Yeah, or? yeah. Yeah, Warren, nice town. Got a main road with a hardware store and a bus stop. I remember that well. Yeah, it's it's pretty busy <laughs> and, and and large, large these days. Actually, I don't. I'm from a, a tinier little bit called Fraser. That's like tucked next to Warren. I don't know if you yeah, know. Yeah, Fraser, tucked in next to Warren, next to Detroit. Right. Yeah. Wow. Why have you been? You spent time in the area? Uh, well, <laughs> I taught for a year at Michigan and Ann Arbor, so I see. I okay. Go down to Detroit and try to avoid the riots. <laughs> yeah yeah um so speaking of uh, hard work <laughs> and, and, and you, you you still speak intelligible english you haven't got the oxford accent that most americans pick up real quick wow my uh british partner is gonna be so mad at you <laughs> <laughs> he uh he really uh really pushes for the uh, british addiction and in, in syntax so um so well, yeah, no. It's it's really important, like lots of outdated, antique, obsolescent things. Mm. <laughs> Somebody uh, should know how to speak British, you know. <laughs> yeah, well, I'm always uh, I'm always saying like, let's talk about the meaning of life and existence, and he's like you didn't, you know, like constantly, you know, uh, paying attention to things like my diction and mm-hmm. you know. Uh, the details, the finer details of my abstract theorizing. When I when I went to Cornell, uh, I took a seminar with Max Black on J.L. Austin. Mm. And we had his philosophical papers, which my friend J.L. Hermson, I guess, edited. And Black said, just read them all. You know, just read them all. So I read and read and read. I was from Doan College in Nebraska. And I was reading ifs and cans. Mm. And according to Austin, Moore thought that... Um, you can do it meant you should do it if you tried. And so I spent a long time wondering why would Moore believe that you ought to do it if you tried? That makes no sense at all <laughs> until somebody nicely explained that in this old fashioned tongue we call British, <laughs> they, they still use the subjunctive and they say shall and should for first person. Mm. So, you know, it's good that somebody said, so I'm glad your partner or your roommate or whoever it is still knows British. Yeah. Somebody should. Um, thank I'm you. Kidding. I'm just kidding, folks. Don't get mad at me. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, very Don't nice. My offer to give a Jowett lecture just because I said that. So funny. Um, so we, we do need to get going soon. You mentioned uh, 
riots before, which I think is uh, really interesting. And of course, the war and you've seen a, you've seen a lot, you know, in in the I arc of the, oh riots, yeah, right, yeah. And um, I'm wondering, like, if there's uh, anything about today's you know philosophical landscape, you know, that you find part like unique, you know, compared to uh, previous eras or, or periods in philosophy like do you have an opinion of what the, the state of philosophy today uh many not consistent but um, i see <laughs> the, the way i look at it um is uh there frege had this beautiful theory sense and reference and out of that, out of his notion of a thought, eventually came the notion of a proposition, which is an abstract object uh, with truth conditions. And uh, that wasn't terribly big in the, in the uh, Austin Grice days, but mm -hmm. it, now it's just philosophy, I don't know what to say dominated, but <laughs> a, a lot of philosophy or a lot of what philosophers do consists in, in logic, uh, not, not basic logic or logic for computers, but uh, modal logic, epistemic logic, and even people who don't do that think in those terms, I think that somehow understanding propositions is the key to understanding the mind. I think that's all completely confused mm. and screwed up. Propositions are just abstract objects we use to help deal with things. Um, and so forth and so on. So, <clears throat> so I I I miss um, what I thought of as analytical philosophy. Um, but, I mean, it's just um, I mean Oxford. I you know I don't want. I mean, there was this golden age to me when I thought of Oxford as the Vatican of philosophy. Right mm. there was Ermson and there was. Uh, Ayer still, or Ayer, whatever. Uh, there was Austin who just died. There was Grice, who, whom I knew for years and years and years. Um, and at the beginning, I included uh, Dummett in there because he had written this short classic article on truth that I liked very much. Hmm. And then something happened. Uh, Dummett ceased to be uh, a short succinct author. Uh, Davidson came and gave the Locke lectures. The two of them put their minds together and influenced these brilliant graduate students like Gareth Evans. And the result has been Oxford's just another place where reams of obscure philosophy are produced just like everywhere else, which mm. is not to knock it, but just say, well, I miss I miss Austin and Ernson and those guys. Yeah. And I aspire to be like them, except for being dead. That's, uh, <laughs> so, All yeah. of us will be like them eventually. Yeah. I'm not too happy. I mean, I'm 76, and frankly, I'm not too happy with anything that's going on in the world, including in philosophy. But on the other hand, you realize, you know... You're not in control. Grow up, Perry. Mm -hmm. Write your little essays, and we're not in control. It's all unfolding, you know. It's all unfolding, right? Progressive eras, or you know, um, yeah. what, was, what was it Nietzsche called it? Like the eternal return, you know. Eternal return, right? Yeah, um, yeah. I, I I really appreciate that, well, and I, I think that seriously, they say if you if you, I know. That's the word. I mean, do you believe that if you if you you know you want would you want to live your life exactly like it was? No, I mean? would. No, <laughs> I try very hard to live the way I want to. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> but yeah. I, I mean, that's the point of the question is is to make you yeah. think about it. Um, yeah. Yeah. So everybody listening, he just, you know, had this idea of the eternal return and basically just asked, like, if you had to live your life an infinite number of times, would you do it? Yeah. Yeah, I would. But I understand that it's it's a very thought provoking question, you know, and it's supposed to help us make better decisions. I don't like, know if we do. It's like, it's like those questions that they like to ask, you know, well, 
if it's necessary, is it necessarily necessary? And if it's necessarily necessary, is it possibly necessarily possibly necessary? Now, once yeah. we get thinking about that, we'll really understand philosophy. Well, <laughs> would I like to live my life an infinite number of times? I don't know. Would yeah. I, yeah. <laughs> well, that's why this, you know, that's why this podcast exists. And that's why Philosophy Talk, yeah. you know, your radio yeah. show exists. So, um, yeah, here's to you know, being plain spoken and relevant to people's lives. Exactly. When you can be. When you can. But now, <laughs> when you one can thing be. is driving me crazy. On that pile of books behind you, the one at the bottom is turned away. Oh, some of them are. Look, even more. Yeah. But the one at the bottom, that must be you know, what got you started. What is that? Oh, there's not, they're not in a particular order. Um, they actually... It looks old too. It could be Bradley or uh, I think it's no, I think it's like the breakdown of the bicameral mind. It was like oh, a oh like a yeah. neuro euro revolution yeah. something book in the is right over there. <laughs> oh, we have the same book right on our there. shelves. No, un unread. <laughs> uh, yeah, I, I read the introduction and I was like, all right, I can come back to this later, but it wasn't particularly, you know, I needed some the, the origin more. of consciousness in the breakdown of the bicameral mind. That's it. Something like that. Something like that. Um, yeah, I think that's, I think that's that. Okay. Um, yeah. Um, okay, we're running up on time, now, now I think. Now we can go on now that we've... What? Oh. Now we can go on now. That <laughs> now, we can go, now we can say goodbye. Yeah, um, well, that's... Only 45 minutes. That's the important thing, you know, when you meet somebody, to know what's on their bookshelf, right? Uh, yeah, you might think knowing what they have taken off their bookshelf. <laughs> oh, yes, that too. Very interesting. Um, okay, so I will, um, I'll link to your website so people can find your uh, book about procrastinating and other books and, and um, stuff if they want to read them. Um, and two, so they... Two new books or three new books out. There's a new Dialogue on Consciousness from mm -hmm. Hackett. Mm -hmm. There's a new book called Frege's Detour from Oxford University Press. Nice. And there's a new book called Essays on something, Language and Information from CSLI Press. Amazing. Okay. Wow. Good you. Yeah. Good for you. Thank you. Um, all right. So everybody, if you want to delve more into these things in a way that is not too obscure, then check out John's work um, and do, uh, do get in contact with me if you have any questions. Um, so yeah, thank you again so much, John. This has been wonderful. Well, thank you. It looks like your podcasts are wonderful. I'll have to start looking at them or listening to how you do <laughs> podcasts, potting them, I guess. I don't know. Potting them. Yeah. Um, sure. You know, let me know what you think. If not, that's okay, too. All right. <laughs> okay. All right. Thank and, you, uh, John.